Players. 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 Players own. Players own. Players own voice. Players own voice. It's Players Own Voice, a podcast from CBC Sports. My name is Anastasia Busis, two-time Olympic speed skater. No matter the sport, it seems some people plan to become leaders in their field, and others have leadership roles thrust upon them. That happened to me in a minor way when I came out during the Sochi Olympics. It happened to my friend Eric Radford in a gigantic way. He didn't set out to become the world's first openly gay gold medalist in a Winter Olympic Games. In fact, until he heard that he'd made that milestone, it never even crossed his mind. But then a funny thing happened. Eric stepped into that leadership role with all the grace you'd expect of a figure skater. But there's a lot more to my old bud, Eric, than skating and standing up for what's right. Have a listen. I am sitting on the bed of a good friend, two-time world champion, 2018 Olympic gold and bronze medalist, silver in 2014 in the team event. He cheats at cards and probably has the most savage would-you-rather suggestions. He's pretty good at that game. None other. Eric Radford. You know me well. How are you doing, first and foremost? Um... I'm actually doing really, really well. I definitely feel a certain level of exhaustion just from the sort of nonstop schedule that I've been living. But everything that's been happening in my life has been so exciting and I'm just trying to take a deep breath each day and soak it all up. You look happy. I am. You retired, what, seven weeks ago? How has that response been? It's amazing you know both Megan and I we got so many supportive messages from people across the country and around the world and um, you know people ask me like is it bittersweet do you feel sad and I don't think I have yet I don't think that moment has come where I you know I'm craving going back to the ice and I I feel you know sad that I'm going to be missing out on competitions or anything like that I think maybe when the season starts later I might feel that but for right now I just feel relieved that I don't have to be going into the rink every day so you're not struggling with like what am I to do or or is it just like (laughs) opportunity forevermore it's been like non-stop of just doing things so I'm actually looking forward to some moments where um I keep on looking forward to a moment where I wake up and I'm like bored Mm -hmm. and I don't know what to do because I haven't really had that moment yet. Um, You know, my schedule is pretty much like booked up until next year, but it's all really exciting stuff. Um, But I do get those little waves of, I guess, uncertainty about the future, like, like anybody does have, and especially an athlete that's sort of transitioning out of their competitive sport. But yeah, I think I got the time to, you know, uh, do what I want to do for a while until I settle back into whatever it is I decide to do. A few months out of Pyeongchang, what does that make you feel sitting here today? Sometimes when I, I look back at my career, it almost feel like it almost feels like it happened to somebody else. Almost as if like, I, I read about Eric Radford as this other person. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, oh, wow, like I, I went out there on that ice and I, I made that all happen. And when I think back to being a kid and where it all began and like having that dream of, you know, standing on the Olympic podium and it, it came true, like all my dreams have come true. I just, I feel so incredibly lucky when I think about all of that. I haven't won Olympic gold, obviously. I've never been a world champion, but I've read things about myself and it's almost given me like this imposter complex. Do you ever get that? Oh yeah. I, I've talked about this with a lot of other athletes that after we would win a competition or especially when I won my first world title, I, you know, it would feel great for like that first like few days and then that imposter complex would settle in and I'd be like, well, like, did I really deserve it? Were the judges just being nice to us? Um, You know, like, was there another reason that, you know, we ended up winning because the other teams just weren't as good? And I would come up with all these, like, reasons why I shouldn't have won. And I don't know where it came from. Um, And it used to happen a lot, almost after every competition. Um, 
except for when we won our second world title. Um, it was the first time where the field was so deep and the odds were really stacked against us. And there were seven teams that probably could have been on the podium. And, you know, everybody had an equal opportunity, the same one that we had. And we were the ones that went out and made it happen and grabbed that opportunity. And there was something surrounding that competition, some sort of energy. And I just felt like, you know what, we deserve that 100%. And I never, ever did get that imposter syndrome. Did anything correlate uh, within that year with your personal life? Um, strangely enough, I mean, Megan, we're coming off, Megan and I were coming off a undefeated season, but the season before. So, I mean, we lost a competition for the first time uh, that season before that world, uh, that 2016 world championship. And, um, it was kind of like uh, Megan and I, we had a, a reset moment where we had to sort of go back and refine what it was that worked so well that season before when we won our first world title. And I think within that, um, you know, I think whenever you do those types of resets, even if it's just for your sport or for one part of your life, it ends up like connecting through all parts of your mm -hmm, life. Absolutely. And, you know, the rest of the season, I just felt so settled and at ease in all areas. I discuss this with Weaver, too. It's so bizarre to me, you know, here is figure skating. It's not individual, but it's not necessarily a team. Or it is a team, but it's a small team. So what do you do when you're not connecting with Megan? I mean, I can't imagine. It's like a relationship. So when you're annoyed and you're like, oh, I don't even want to see you <laughs> as train, you know, training twice a day, six days a week, 11 and a half months out of the year, what do you do to reconnect? I even find it surprising how much Megan and I have always just been on the same page mm -hmm. throughout so many or on so many aspects of our career. And I think that in those moments when we were feeling off, we were feeling off together. It wasn't necessarily that one of us was feeling one way and one of us was feeling another way. And I think it was just that we were both kind of lost in the same way. So we needed to sit down together with our team and find our path together. Mm -hmm. When you win Olympic gold, was it fulfillment of a lifelong dream or was there a little bit of an existential crisis that came with that? Like a what next? Well, interestingly is that we won the gold but then we still had to compete mm -hmm. for our individual event. So I knew going in that if we did win the gold, I, I had a, a plan, an emotional plan of enjoying that moment on the podium, celebrating a little bit afterwards, but then that's it. And like, then it was like, almost like I had to forget that all happened and it was reset, new competition starting. So, in that moment, it was just, it was pure bliss. I, when I describe it, I, I felt like I had two invisible hands grabbing each cheek and just pulling it up into the air. I could not stop smiling. My, my family, my fiance, they were all there in front of the, the podium, you know, watching the ceremony. I was with some of my best friends, you know, jumping up onto that podium and I always imagined the moment, of course, like, I was like, am I gonna smile? Am I gonna laugh? Am I gonna cry? And it was, I never really considered myself to be like that emotional in those types of moments. But as soon as the, the anthem started playing, like, I was like, oh my God, like, I was so overwhelmed with a, like amazing, incredible emotion that it just like started to make me cry. And it was all just wonderful. It's just amazing. It's everything that you would probably imagine, you know, winning the Olympics would be. But immediately after that, it was kind of just like very calm, um, contained kind of compartmentalized that moment and then moved on to the next portion of the competition. You mentioned your fiance. Uh, when did he come into your life? Three years ago, three years and like one week ago. Um, we met through a mutual friend and just, you know, it's so easy. Like we just hit it off. And I, uh, when I, when I think about uh, Luis and our relationship, I. I wrote a post about it when I proposed to him and I said that, you know, 
simplicity is such like a beautiful thing and you know when you hear like a simple little song and it just resonates so strong with you or you you see a piece of art and it's not really that complicated and there's just something there's a simplicity to it and I feel like there's something about it that just resonates so strong within that sort of artistic world and my relationship with him and my love with him I, I just call it like simple love it's just very easy and straightforward and makes me so happy did that bring about a lightness to your skating Definitely. I think maybe I don't tell him enough how much I appreciate him being there and supporting me through all of the ups and downs. And my favorite part about this relationship is that, you know, even when I won the Olympics, the fact that, you know, Luis was there with me, it amplified at times, you know, a million. It makes every like experience in my life that much better. You talked about a your joy of a simple little song you're all, you're also you know a very accomplished musician little Pete Chitty Patrick Chan skated to one of your songs two years ago yeah two seasons ago two seasons ago if you could do it all again would you choose figure skating or being a musician oh that's a really good question I'm a good it's <laughs> gonna go viral you know there's there's moments where I feel like I'm so far behind in the other areas of my life and I I, am, I I think about like, oh, where could I be if I had pursued something else? Like music, like I had gone to school and would I be as successful or, you know, all of those sort of like what ifs. But I just, I truly do love skating. So, and I feel like skating could be a launching pad for me with my music. I think it already has in a way. So I think I like to keep things the same. That's my final answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> you know, you've gone through a few skating partners and whatnot, uh, as everyone does in in their career, ups and downs. And you've been very vulnerable in saying, yeah, I've been lost in life. What was kind of a turning point to really not just find yourself in skating, but find yourself comfortable in your own skin? I mean, I, in a way, I, I think this answer is fairly obvious, but like when I came out publicly, it was never seemed like an issue or like I never even thought about my sexuality or thought that, oh, I was different than other athletes in any sort of way. Um, so I think what I was surprised to feel when I, after coming out publicly was the way it truly made me feel more free and light on the ice, just in terms of expressing myself. It's like you settle into being yourself more and more like the more you experience you have the more you discover about yourself and you start to feel lighter and lighter because you just don't care about what everybody else is thinking mm -hmm. anymore and it's so liberating and it truly did translate for me onto the ice as I was as when I would be performing with Megan or when we were working on choreography I felt like I could just reach beyond where I used to be able to when you were in those moments of feeling lost though, uh, where was your mental health? I've always considered myself to be a very in control emotionally and mentally uh, type of person, just mentally strong. Um, and if I ever did, like, I, I rarely ever get angry. I rarely ever feel really jealous. I feel like I'm a very like self-analytical person, very self-aware. And, you know, last season, after my injury at the World Championships, after finishing seventh, you know, losing our world title, you know, everything was falling apart. Megan and I had tr uh, changed our coaching situation, our training situation, and I felt just something inside of me almost just like crack, and I had like a, a total sort of like breakdown. And it was the first time where I couldn't control the emotions like nothing I was doing in my mind was helping to stop like the horrible feeling I was having like in my heart and in my chest and in my like my psyche it's almost like I had to retrain my mind and redirect my focus in my life in that moment and it took a while it took almost a month and a half for me to start feeling you know back completely normal where I'd have you know anxiety free days where I just felt you know, happy all the way through. And I think that it was just like a consistent, um, almost like an exercise of just, you know, thinking about all the things that I have going on in my life, um, 
you know, uh, refining that uh, that motivation and that love I had for skating, and then also just you know talking to talking to my friends daily, sharing my experiences and having them be there for me. It was very nourishing. With all the success that you've had, feeling that way, um, was there a lot of shame that came that came about when you'd feel anxious like that? So. That was something I realized too, and something I find so um, that I couldn't relate to when I would hear messages about your mental health, and um, I always, you know, and how there is this stigma that people have trouble opening up about it. And I was like, oh, that seems so strange because, like, if I had a problem, like, I would just talk to somebody about it. You know, it seems so straightforward. Like, of course, that's what you would do. But I remember feeling it was almost like coming out again. I imagine that people have a specific. Uh, way that they see me in the public eye or the way my friends see me like I feel like my friends know me as a very like mentally strong and stable type of person so for me to come along and be like I am struggling it was so vulnerable like such a vulnerable moment and it you know it took some courage and like inner strength to like call somebody and be like listen I, I need to talk how could I have lost control like that how did your teammates react to it? I never really talked to my teammates so much as I just talked to my really close friends. And I have a few friends who are, are doctors as well, so I was in contact with them a lot. Um, so it's something that I, I didn't actually talk about very much until a little bit more recently and that a lot of people didn't know that I actually went through. You are now essentially the face of uh, ending homophobia in sports and I've had a little bit of um, that spotlight a few years ago and I really struggled with balancing you know kind of my personal life and then being I don't want to say poster child but just having that responsibility of portraying a very unified message and you know a unified message for a community that's not monolithic how do you balance that responsibility or that stress or does it stress you out? Where, where does that fall in your life now? I honestly, going into the Olympics, didn't think about what my story was going to be or how my, I didn't even think my sexuality would really play into anything. And it wasn't until, I think it was after the medal ceremony that I saw the tweet about me being the first openly gay male to win the Winter Olympics. And I was just like, wow, mm -hmm. like, I didn't, I didn't even realize that. And I, I think like that was like a catalyst for me to, you know, become a voice for the LGBT community in sports, uh, even more so than I already kind of had been. And I realized that, you know, it carries a lot of responsibility. And I think being an athlete, I want to do my best at everything. So I put a lot of pressure on myself to try and you know, speak well and, you know, reach as many people as possible and present myself in the best way possible. And sometimes you, you know, you feel like you can't please everybody or that you could have always done better, you know, and it can be, it can get overwhelming at times. But one thing that I'm really appreciative of is that the way I get to be an activist in, in a way is that I'm just telling my own story. Mm -hmm. I just think back to when I was a kid and how I felt. And if I could have, if like my younger self could have, you know, seen my future self, I would have, it would have helped me so much. It would have given me so much more confidence. Um, and probably would have just eased a lot of like that sort of t inner torment I felt, you know, through my uh, teenage years. When did you know you were gay? I mean, I think like most uh, young, young kids, like when I hit puberty, I started to notice that I was more, you know, attracted to men, but it took me a long time to really accept it myself. Mm -hmm. I felt a lot of uh, shame and guilt in those feelings. And, you know, I kind of started feeling those around 13, 14, but it probably wasn't until I was 16 or 17 that I finally was just like, you know what, this is who I am. And there's other people like me out there. And this is not a, a strange or a bad thing. Growing up gay, small town, northern Ontario, did you ever flirt with the idea of, of quitting sport? Or was figure skating 
a safe space. I find it so funny how figure skating was both a safe space, but the catalyst for a lot of my bullying mm -hmm. at the same time. I can remember times like going into the rink and there would be like a group of, you know, whatever, like kids outside the front and I would walk in and they would be calling me names. And then if I saw them like watching me skate or like pointing or laughing, like it caused me a lot of insecurity and anxiety. And then I would get home and I would be crying to my mom and I was like, I don't understand why they're making fun of me because I like to figure skate. Like it just seems so stupid that it's like just a sport that I'm doing that I, I like. And, um, and I think that I remember, I remember it going through my mind, like, well, I could just like quit and then they can't make fun of me anymore. But I mean, I loved it too much and maybe deep, deep down below all of that insecurity I had from what they were doing, I, I had a, a confidence that was there enough to kind of keep me pushing through. You have a very quiet confidence. Yes, I think I do. Pump your own tires, <laughs> I don't think I have loud, that's what I mean. I'm not a loudly confident person, but I, I think I am a quiet, confident person. You have person. quiet confidence when you're dancing too. You've given me a few tips on the dance floor. You've, you've been like, dance more like Joanny Rochette. You might try. <laughs> um, is figure skating something you do or is it who you are? I think it's both. I think that it is something that I do but the reason I do it well is because of who I am. So it all kind of just ties in together. Two-time world champion, three-time Olympic medalist, first openly gay man to win an Olympic gold medal at the Winter Olympics. What? Yeah, he's, look, he's flicking his hair. He's saying, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> Does that even, I, do you identify with that? Um, there was a moment at the end of uh, the Stars on Ice tour where it was like the sun was setting, Luis and I were in a taxi going back to our hotel and for the first time it all really kind of hit me, everything that I've accomplished and I could for the first time kind of see it from outside my own perspective and kind of imagine as if, you know, if I was watching, like me watching like Usain Bolt win and the way like I kind of, you know, you put these athletes up on a mm -hmm. pedestal because you just see their accomplishments and how amazing they are. And I was just, you know, kind of flooded with pride in that moment. And I just felt proud of myself. And, but I mean, that's just one very small moment since everything's happened. And I, I feel like so much of what I've been doing since the Olympics is, um, um, you know, kind of talking outwardly to people, sharing my experience outwardly that I haven't had a lot of time to really just think and focus inwardly about everything that I've been through. Hopefully it all finally sinks in. In a hundred years, when this podcast is dust and we're all gone, how do you hope people remember you or talk about you? I hope I'm remembered as the out Canadian figure skater um, the kind person, hopefully, um, you know, that shared his story and was able to inspire a young generation for the LGBT community. You will be remembered as that. I'm also putting this on the record. Eric Radford cheats at cards. <laughs> Do not forget that either. It's only because I want to win. <laughs> <laughs> Win at all costs. Win at all costs. <laughs> That's great. As the COC's uh, motto is virtuous. <laughs> Eric Radford, card cheater. Um, also quite good at uh, Would You Rather. Yes. I've, I've heard a few of them and I still, That's I right. don't think that they're quite on brand for this podcast. No, no. But uh, if anyone buys us a beer, we'll probably yeah. uh, invite you to the game. So... <laughs> Thank you, buddy. I know that you have an incredibly, incredibly busy schedule, and I am proud to march behind you. Not because you're a good person, but because you are just painfully good looking. <laughs> he has like this stubble that's rivaling Brad Pitt right now. Little George Cooney. You're making me blush. Salt and pepper. Eric Radford, thank you so much, buddy. Full time beauty. Thank you so much. Peace. 
I recorded that conversation with Eric Radford in downtown Toronto. Players Own Voice podcast is a CBC Sports production. Email your comments to us at playersownvoicepodcast at cbc.ca. Social media at hashtag playersownvoice. David Giddens is the producer. I'm Anastasher on Insta and Twitter and all that jazz. Thanks for listening.